So thank you so much for joining us. This is at, we're at the one o'clock hour and we are doing um, story time with San Diego Zoo Global Press. Yay. Um, so we have our presenters, Carrie Hessler and Georgiana Irvine with us here today. And I'll be giving a quick bio to start with. Um, but we, in this session, the San Diego Writers Festival is bringing the world famous San Diego Zoo to you. Come listen to Carrie Hessler and Georgiana Irvine read aloud from their books inspired by the animals from our fabulous zoo. They will share heartwarming tales of animals who survived challenges and thrived under the loving care of humans. San Diego Zoo Global Press is the book publishing division of the San Diego Zoo Global, which is committed to leading the fight against extinction. And both Carrie and Georgianne will also be with us um, at 1.30 for the first Kidlet panel on um, women in the Kidlet business. Um, so I want to, I'm gonna share my screen. So give me a second to pop that up. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and then give some a quick bio um but we have our story time happening right now and oh oh that's me hi <laughs> i'm here mainly to do introductions um and then i'm gonna pop off but we have carrie hessler here with us today um and carrie has more than 20 years of experience in elementary education and has trained new and veteran teachers at numerous institutions such as the University of San Diego. She helped launch Blue Sneaker Press in 2015. Um, and she, in addition to um, writing books, she also writes educational curriculum. Some of her books include Tie the Quiet Giraffe, Coop Squad, The Aqua Adventure, and A Letter from Tasha Snow Leopard Tail, and A Wish for a Pangolin. And then we also have um, Georgian Irvine with us here today. And Georgian has devoted her career to raising awareness about animals and wildlife conservation. She is the director of corporate publishing for San Diego Zoo Global, where she has worked for 40 years. And she's the author of over two dozen children's books, some of which are Ruxa and Reina, A Cheetah and Dog's True Story of Friendship and Miracles, Karen's Heart, The True Story of a Brave Baby Orangutan, Fabulous Floyd, The True Story of a Flamingo Who Never Gave Up, and Mosey Musi, A True Tale About a Baby Monkey Raised by His, by his Grandma. Um, some of the interesting facts that, I, I, that, that stuck out to me about Georgian was she has been to a lot of places on Earth. She likes to travel. So she's been to the jungles of Borneo and South America, to the mountains of China and the glaciers of Alaska, as well as the savannas of Africa and, and and um, the outback of Australia. That's crazy, wow. Welcome, we're glad that you're here with us. Um, you know, I, I know that we're not as glamorous as the, out, the, as the down back, but, or the, the um, outback, but we're, we're glad that you're here with us nonetheless. So um, I am going to, to, to pop out and leave it to both Georgian and Carrie to share their books and to, um, yeah, to, to talk about their, their love of animals. Thank you, thank you. And I, I think I'll be starting and then I'll toss it to Carrie. So my, first of all, thank you for inviting us into your home today. I'm really excited to share some animal stories with you. And I specialize in writing stories about real animals, real animals that either live or have lived at the San Diego Zoo and Safari Park. And all of my stories are illustrated with photos. And I'm going to read from one of my books today, but before I do that, I want to share a favorite animal fact from each of the other books. Things that I was amazed when I was researching the book, things that were very, very fascinating to me, and I think they'll be fascinating to you. So let's start with Fabulous Floyd. So this book is about a flamingo who is one of our ambassador animals, which, which means he is very friendly toward people, and we use him to help educate people about flamingos. And he was born with what we like to say two left feet, so he needed surgery to correct his feet so that he could walk normally like a regular flamingo. And what was amazing is when, he was recovering, he had to be held 24 seven by his caretakers. So think about this, they're holding a flamingo on their lap and guess what they discovered, something I never knew. 
flamingos snore and they dream. And I even saw a video and their snores are kind of like, just kind of a little soft snore. And when they dream, they're twitching their feet. And I, that was my favorite new flamingo fact I learned from my Floyd book. With the Mosi Musa book, this is about a baby monkey whose mother just wouldn't care for him. We don't know why. So his grandma Thelma decided to care for him instead. So it's, it's his story about growing up with his grandma and eventually at the end of the story, he does become friends with his mother again. And he is a vervet monkey, which is a monkey from Africa. What was fascinating to me about vervet monkeys, they have a pouch in their cheeks. So think about when you put food in your mouth and you shove it in your cheek. Well, the vervet monkeys have a cheek pouch and they can store the, cheek, the, the food for a while in that pouch. So look at this. Mosi Musa put a square piece of vegetable in his mouth to store for later. And this is one of my favorite pictures in the book. You can actually see the square of that vegetable. It's called a jicama um, in his cheek pouch. And he ate it a little later. It just sat there in the cheek pouch. So that was my favorite vervet monkey fact from the Mosi Musa book. Now from the Ruxa and Reina cheetah book, I know you think I'm probably gonna tell you that my favorite fact is that cheetahs are the fastest land mammal in the world and that they can run up to 70 miles an hour for a short time, which is as fast as your car can drive. But that's not the fact I'm going to tell you. So this is a story about a, a friendship between a cheetah and a dog, and each had a challenge in its life that they overcame, and part of the reason they overcame these things was because they had such great care at the San Diego Zoo Safari Park, and also because they were there for each other. So Ruxa needed some surgery, and the fact that fascinated me was that if you shave the hair on a cheetah, they actually have the spots on their skin. You can see the spots on his skin. And a lot of people think that the fur just grows that way, but no, the, the cheetah has the black spots on the skin. So those are my two, three favorite facts from those three books. And I'm going to read to you a little bit from my Karen book. And right before I give Ch Carrie a chance to talk, I'm going to show you something that nobody has seen yet except the people I work with. And that is the cover of our newest book that's coming out in the fall. But this book is called Karen's Heart, The True Story of a Baby Orangutan. And I'm going to read to you a little bit out of this book. I don't have time for the whole thing. Let's start with this book. So here you go, you can see the pictures. A baby orangutan is born. Karen, a Sumatran orangutan with wild and crazy orange hair, was only two days old when she was rushed to the baby animal nursery at the San Diego Zoo. Her orangutan mother didn't know how to nurse her newborn infant. Karen wasn't getting enough to eat. Her keepers at the zoo were concerned about her. So we needed to have it that people would now need to care for Karen until she was strong enough to live with her orangutan family again. And Karen was tiny. She weighed only three pounds when she arrived at the nursery. So to keep her warm, her nursery mothers wrapped her in a cozy blanket. Karen also wore a diaper to help keep her clean. This is my favorite picture in the whole book. Before I read this to you, look at that. Look at Karen's fingernails. I don't know why this is my favorite picture, maybe because her fingernails are so perfect looking. But look at how cute she is. So let's read a little bit more. Sweet baby ape. Karen was a sweet baby ape who made funny faces when she was tickled behind her ears or on her tummy. Her lips were soft, wrinkly, and very flexible. And I can tell you, I have been kissed by a baby orangutan and their lips are also very soft. In just a short time, Karen won over the hearts of her caretakers. 
When Karen was hungry, she chirped and she often squealed to let her nursery mothers know it was time to eat. She drank milk from a bottle several times a day. And after each feeding, her nursery moms held her up, patted her back, and burped her just like a human baby. This is probably another favorite part of the book because I get to say a special word. Karen's burp started out quiet, but the last one was always really loud. Okay, if your parents are there, tell them to cover their ears. Sometimes Karen even farted. Everyone would giggle. Rub-a-dub-dub. -dub. Bath time was fun for Karen. She was bathed in a sink instead of a tub. Karen liked playing with the warm water. She made a game out of the spray by catching it in her mouth and let it, letting it dribble down her chin. She didn't even mind the soap suds because her nursery moms lathered her with baby shampoo that wouldn't sting her eyes. Once she was clean, Karen's hair was dried with a blow dryer, which made it stick straight up. You can see it sticking straight up on her. Karen also loved playing the puff game. Her nursery mom softly blew a puff of air toward Karen, who liked the feel of it on her mouth and face. So the nurse, nursery mom would go, and Karen would open her mouth and it just felt really good. And you can see in this picture how her hair is sticking straight up. Reunited. When Karen was a year old, she was strong enough to be reunited with her orangutan family. She didn't need her bottle anymore. Now she could eat fruits, vegetables, and orangutan kibble on her own. Fernando and Mike, the orangutan caregivers, were thrilled to have her back at the orangutan exhibit. Since Karen's mother, Carta, was moved to another zoo, an older female named Josephine adopted Karen, this is Josephine, as if she were her own baby. The pair played on the giant jungle gym together. They snuggled with each other when they slept and they ate all their meals together. Visitors came from all around the world to visit cute and playful Karen. And Karen learned about life as an orangutan from Josephine, who was very protective at, of her. And at the zoo, we really, really want the parent animals to raise their own babies. And the only time we step in and help is when the parent is having trouble with the baby. And that's why Karen was raised in the nursery for a very short time. But what's wrong with Karen? But something wasn't quite right. Even though Karen received excellent care from her keepers, she wasn't growing as quickly as she should be. Fernando noticed that she was tired much of the time, and she wasn't as playful and active as most other baby orangutans. Fernando began to worry about her. And because Fernando cared for Karen almost every day, it was really easy for him to tell if she wasn't feeling well. Karen's examination. And I'm just gonna read these pages and then I'll tell you what happens at the end of the story. When a San Diego Zoo veterinarian examined Karen, she found that Karen had a heart murmur. This meant that her heart wasn't working properly. Several heart specialists called cardiologists also examined Karen. These doctors worked with people, but they thought they could help Karen since orangutan hearts and human hearts are very, very similar. They discovered that Karen had been born with a penny-sized hole between two chambers in her heart. For Karen to lead a healthy, normal orangutan life, the hole would have to be repaired. Karen needed open heart surgery, which had never before been done on an orangutan. Without it, she could die at a very young age. Karen would have to be brave. And I can tell you that Karen did have the open heart surgery. You can see, look at the surgery. I actually watched it. This happened many years ago, but they brought so much equipment in that I probably could have had a heart lung transplant done on myself with all the equipment that they brought in. And 
the heart surgery was very successful, but then Karen got an infection in her lungs and she had this infection for two weeks and we didn't know she was gonna live, but she did live and she survived. And Karen lives at the San Diego Zoo today. And if you go to our San Diego Zoo website, sandiegozoo.org and go to Ape Cam, you can see Karen orangutan. And if you go to the zoo, she's not the smallest orangutan in the exhibit, she is probably the medium-sized one, and she always sits at the window, and she likes to um, turn somersaults, and she has very light eyes. So I'm going to show you something. As I mentioned, in the fall, we have a very a, a new book coming out, and this is the first time this cover has ever been seen in public, so I'm excited to share it with you. There's a little bit of a glare, but it's called Saving Mocha, the true tale of a rescued tiger cub. And it's a story about a tiger who was being smuggled from Mexico into San Diego, and he was rescued and he was taken to our San Diego Zoo Safari Park. But you're gonna have to get this book to read the story, and all of our books are available on shopzoo.com. And now I would like to toss to my very good friend and fellow author, Carrie Hassler, who has some other fun stories to share with you. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. My name is Carrie Hassler. Um, Virginia, do I need to do anything as far as going to the main screen? No, you're good. Okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so, hi, I'm Carrie Hassler, and I write books for the San Diego Zoo with Georgianne. I'm so fortunate to be able to do that. And as you may be able to guess, um, my books are all about animals. Um, but I have a very different type of book. I write picture books, and my books are fiction. Um, so that means they're made up stories, whereas um, Georgianne's books are nonfiction, true stories. Um, but I, too, uh, spend a lot of time really learning about the animals while I'm writing a story. I think it's really important because one thing that I like to do in my stories is I like to weave in facts and information about the animals so that when you're reading the story, you can learn a little bit about that animal while you're also enjoying the story. So a lot of times though, those facts and information not only um, can come into the story, but they also can actually inspire the entire story. That's something that happened with my book called um, Tie the Quiet Giraffe. And I think most of us know that giraffes have very long necks. They're famous for their long necks. And they're also the tallest animals on earth, which a lot of people already know. But did you know that they are very quiet animals? So I was thinking about this. Well, lions roar and um, wolves howl and parrots squawk, but what sound does a giraffe make? Well, I couldn't really think of one either. They, so I found out that they do make some noises, hums and grunts, but not very much. They're very quiet animals. And so that really inspired an entire story about Ty the Quiet Giraffe, who um, is very quiet, but he teaches the other animals that even though you're quiet, everybody has something very important to say, and he does too. In another one of my stories, which is called um, A Letter from Tashi, it's about a snow leopard, I learned that snow leopards live high in the mountains and mostly in the Himalayan mountains. And I also learned that they're nomadic. That means that they move around. They don't like to stay in one place. And they're nomadic because they're looking for food. So I found it was really important. Okay, I want my story to take place in the Himalayas. That's where the setting's gonna be. And I also wanna find a way, how can I make sure that my snow leopard is um, nomadic in the story? And I thought, hmm, well, I know a job that's a kind of nomadic where people move around and that those are mail carriers, people who deliver the mail. So in my story, I have um, Tashi and her mom delivering the mail and they take their mail, the mail to all of the different animals in the Himalayan mountains, um, pikas and marmots and ibex. And my latest story is called A Wish for a Pangolin. And I think this is a very special story because it's about a very special and unique animal. And many people have never heard of a pangolin or know what that is. And we thought, wow, it would be really neat to teach kids about this very special animal. And also 
these animals are in a little bit of trouble. That means that they're in danger. There's, they're disappearing very quickly from the earth. And so we thought if, if we teach people about pangolins, we also can get people to care about them and work with us to try to help save them so that they can stay around on our planet for a long time. So a little bit about pangolins, because they are so unique, is one of the things that makes them, this is a real photo of a, uh, a photo of a real pangolin, is that they're the only mammals covered in scales. Now, I, when I think of scales, I think of fish or snakes or other reptiles. I don't think of mammals. So that's pretty special that they're covered in scales. They don't have scales everywhere. They have uh, a little bit of fur and hair on their tummies, but mostly all scales. Um, some people think that they look a little bit like anteaters, but they're not, they're their own creature. Some other things that I learned about pangolins was that their babies called pups, which I think is so cute, like to ride on their mom's tail and back. That's how they get around, which is pretty cute. And because they're covered in scales, well, and also because they don't have teeth, instead they use a very long tongue to slurp up ants and termites, which is their main source of food. They don't have any teeth, so they don't have a good way to defend themselves with teeth. So when they sense danger or trouble, their main protection is that they roll up into a very tight ball and their hard scales can protect them from predators, which is pretty neat fact. So when I was writing this story, I thought, oh, I wanna make sure to include some of these really cool details and fun facts that I learned about pangolins in the story um, so that kids can learn about pangolins too. But other things that I do when I'm writing my story is I also wanna learn about the other animals that, um, that, are in, that are in the area. And so my story takes place in Thailand, which is one of the countries that pangolins live. And so I also learned that in Thailand, there are Asian elephants. So I learned a little bit about them and made sure to include those in my story. I also wanted to learn a little bit about their habitat. Where do they live? In Thailand and in Southeast Asia, which is the area, one of the areas they live, they live in a lot of jungles which have waterfalls that look like this one. And in the book, you might see an illustration that looks a lot like this. That's because we use real um, images and real pictures of real places as inspiration for things that go on in the story. Another thing that I like to do in my stories is I like to learn about the region and the culture of the area. And so because my story is set in Thailand, I learned a little bit about this very special festival called Yi Pang. It's also called the Lantern Festival. And it's where people light lanterns and release them into the sky and make a wish while they're doing that. And um, so I included a little bit of that too. So I'm gonna read a little bit of my story to you, Wish from Pangolin. And while you're, read, while you're seeing the story, see if you can find some of those fun facts in the story that I, that I learned and made sure to weave in to the story too. So this is called A Wish for Pangolin and it is illustrated by Christina Wald. In all of my books, I also make sure to include fun facts at the beginning and at the end, and also a map that shows where the animals live in the world. And so here you can see that some pangolins live in Africa and some live in Asia. Deep in the jungle of uh, Thailand, just before night turned to day, Priya, the pangolin spotted something, a mound of dirt rising from the ground. Look, Chatri, termites, she pointed out to her pup. With her sharp claws, Priya dug through the termite mound to reveal a feast. Chatri moved himself down toward her nose. The two pangolins slurped up termite after termite with their long, sticky tongues. As the pangolins ate, Priya looked down. She saw footprints, human footprints. Chatri, it's not safe here, hurry, Priya called anxiously. Chatri crawled up his mother's tail and clung to her back. The pangolins quickly scurried to their fig tree home. Its enormous roots spread across the jungle floor like tentacles. Priya began expertly climbing with Chatri riding piggyback. High up in the tree where a branch met the trunk, the pangolin slipped into the safety of a hollow just as dawn was breaking. Mama, why did we have to hurry home? Chatri asked. 
The footprints belong to hunters, Priya replied. We need to hide, plus it's time for us to sleep. Why do we sleep during the day? We're nocturnal, Priya answered. We're supposed to sleep during the day and find our food at night. But we have to be careful in the dark. So the hunters don't catch us? Chachi asked, that's right. So the hunters don't catch us. So what's one thing that's a little bit um, sad is that um, uh, pangolins are unfortunately being um, hunted for their scales. And their scales um, are actually made out of a material called keratin, which is the same thing that your fingernails and your hair is made out of. And a, a lot of people think that those scales have special healing powers, and, um, but they don't because they're just made out of the stuff that your hair and your fingernails is made out of. So it's, um, th that's why they're unfortunately disappearing quickly from our planet. Um, so I'll continue a little bit. I don't think I'll have time to finish the entire book, but we'll read a little bit more. Priya looked at Chatri. See our scales? She pointed at the hard brown scales that covered both of their bodies. They protect us. Like a shield, Chatri asked. That's right, like a shield. Priya curled her tail around her pup. Chatri, did you know that your name means brave knight? Your scales are like a coat of armor, just like what a brave knight wears. You will have to be brave, Priya continued. I know you can do it. Chatri looked down at his scales. Our scales make us look like an artichoke or a pineapple. I'm sorry, pie, or a pine cone, or a pineapple. They do, and they both giggled and curled up and went to sleep. Just as the bright light of the afternoon sun began to soften into dusk, the pangolins woke up. It was time to begin their search for a new home. With Chatri on her back, Priya cautiously made her way along the forest floor, always on the lookout for more footprints. Hold on, Chatri. She instructed and stay quiet. Deeper into the forest they went. Priya saw fewer and fewer footprints. This must be the right direction, she thought. Look, Mama, Chatri whispered. Together they looked up at the full moon, which hung in the sky like a pearl. It's beautiful, she replied, but the full moon would also make it easier for hunters to see them. We must stay in the shadows, Chatri. So thank you, Carrie. That's about all the time that we have. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us, please, for folks that are dying at the edge of their seat to find out what happened, um, how can they access your books? Yes. So um, if you want to learn more about my books, and I also have a bunch of downloadable fun activities about um, animals and about my books, you can visit my website, which is carriehassler.com, and you can buy any of these books at shopzoo.com. That's the online San Diego Zoo uh, store. Great. And like Georgie Ann mentioned, you can also buy her books on um, Shop Zoo. Yep. You sure well. can. And you when we're when we're out of quarantine, you can go to the zoo and see all these <laughs> the stars of these fabulous books. But thank you so much, both of you, for being here today. And I know that we're gonna see you very shortly in a couple minutes. Um, but we're gonna go ahead and pop over to Jennifer and um, we'll see you guys soon at 1 30. Great. Thank Bye. you for having us. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 See you soon. Thank you guys. That was awesome.